Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Yankee Town Community Church. I almost said United Methodist. But, uh, good morning, Pastor. Am I doing okay? <laughs> he doesn't know what I'm going to say next. You know, right? <laughs> I don't know. He's embarrassed. Hey, it is just a blessing to be in God's house with God's people. Some gathered here in the sanctuary, uh, some watching right now on Facebook, and later they'll be watching on YouTube. We welcome all who are listening to God's house, wherever that might happen to be for you today. We welcome all to the Lord's house. Dee, did you want to say something about the Christmas boxes? Yes. Come on. <laughs> there are boxes in the back that are already put together, or you can just get a flat sheet and put it together yourself. When you get the box filled, and I'll go over what to go in it in just a little bit, there's a shoebox label that needs to get taped on the front here. It says place your label right here. The label you will select if your box is for a boy or a girl, and what ages or the age range that you are packing your box for. As Pastor mentioned, I think a week or two ago, while the box is targeted for a specific child, it's going to impact the lives of mom and dad, aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters. So a lot of things will get shared. So I, I don't worry about being super specific, although I do target that age group. Um, what to put in it, things, well, first of all, before you even start filling it, start praying for the child that is going to receive this, the child and that family. Because this is really an evangelistic tool. You know, this represents God's love, and it represents your love. A lot of people like to put in a picture of their family. On one case, I witnessed a teenage girl when she got her box, and she found the picture of a teenage girl who had made that box just for her. I mean, she was shrieking and, and holding that picture up to her chest and just going bananas. So, I mean, it was, it was really an awesome thing. And they like to have some idea who it's coming from. Um, they ask that you pack some type of a wow toy, something fun, some school items. Um, um, uh, school items, hygiene items, and also it's nice to, in, to put in there an encouraging note. If you don't want to put in a family picture or a picture of yourself, maybe you don't have one that's current or, or for whatever reason, I've also taken pictures that are like Christmas cards. And just because it's something bright and pretty, a lot of these kids will have never, ever, ever had a gift before never had a present before and they don't have a lot of bright colors around them there might be a lot of dirt and trees and but still it's not a lot of color so if i'm going to put things in there i try to add color whenever i can um, the things that we do not want to see in there are liquids or breakables and no war related toys uh, i was kind of surprised i went to walmart yesterday and i was going through the toy department and boy there's a lot of space alien toys and and war toys and uh, you know that's not a good godly message so look for something that that will impart the message that that we want to which is love god's love um i mentioned the label you need to include if you can include a ten dollar check put it in an envelope stick it inside that check helps with shipping, but also each child who receives a box has an opportunity to take a 12-week discipleship program. So they get their own materials written in their language. At the end of that 12-week discipleship course, they get a Bible in their own language. So that's what that $10 goes for. So, um, If you have any questions, just ask. 
I've got a couple of boxes out there that uh, have some sample kinds of items in there. I leave mine open at home until I'm finished packing and I keep adding stuff here and there and here and there. When, it's, when you're all done, put in a rubber band around it because it's gonna get shuffled and moved several times and that will help keep all of your contents in there as it's getting moved. So, anything else you can think of, Janet? Tell her about the basket underneath if they need anything. Yes, there is a basket out in front under in the foyer out there that has a number of items. Quite a few of us, as we go throughout the year, if we find crayons for 50 cents, we might buy just a whole bag of them, you know, and, and put them out there. Or socks. Um, another thing that I witnessed had to do with socks, we were delivering packages in Mexico, and there was a little boy, he was in the two to four year age bracket. He had gotten his box, he went back, and then he came back up and he was tugging on the side of my dress and of course he spoke Spanish and I didn't, so I didn't know what he was saying. I had to go get an interpreter. And she came over, oh, and the other thing, he was tugging on me, but he also had a ball in his hand, a small ball. And so what the interpreter told me, he said was, could I please have a pair of socks? I have never had a pair of socks. And he wanted to, he wanted to give the ball up for a pair of socks. So, you know, they need necessities as well as the wow things. I also like to include some little containers because whatever stuff they have, they don't have anything to put it in. They'll have this box, but I like to put little clear plastic boxes and different things in there too because they just don't have anything. So, Well, we've come to worship our Savior, Jesus Christ. And to that end, let us prepare our hearts while Diane plays the prelude for us. John 4, verses 23 and 24. But the hour is coming, and now is when the truth worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth.
standing on the promises of verses 41 through 50. Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem, Jer Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and saw him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, so it was after, that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his, un his, uh, his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. You may be seen. As, as they had done every year, Joseph and Mary and their family celebrated Passover at Jerusalem. And along with the accompanying feast of unleavened bread, the Passover festival was something that lasted about eight days. When it was over, they, Mary and Joseph, the company who had traveled with them, they, they traveled about a a day's journey from Jerusalem. They were heading back to Nazareth. And they traveled about a day's journey from Jerusalem. Now, the distance from Nazareth to Jerusalem, as simply noted from one point to another, is about 60 miles. Traveling by the roads that existed then, it was a distance of about 90 miles 
by road. That is roughly the equivalent of traveling from here to Lake City. That's about 90 miles. And though, though caravans commonly traveled at least 20 miles a day, usually the first day of travel was intentionally shorter and slower. And that facilitated an economic retrieval of missing goods. If you got a, day, a day's journey away and you realized, oh, I forgot my pillow, you could go back. You could go back. Or if you got a day's journey and you said, I forgot my son, <laughs> you could go back and retrieve him. So having a shorter first day of travel facilitated an economic retrieval of missing goods or persons in the event that something or someone had been left behind. And that's what happened for Mary and Joseph. After their first day's journey, Mary and Joseph and their group of family and friends with whom they had traveled stopped at a suitable village to rest. And it was there that they discovered that Jesus was not among them. They had presumed incorrectly that Jesus was with a relative or with a neighbor or with a friend in their traveling group, but they were mistaken about that. So frantically, you can imagine they would be frantic about this, frantically they returned to Jerusalem searching intently on every side road, between or behind every wall, cautiously peering into, into windows and, and around doors. Every little sound or movement or voice along the way prompted hope within them that they had found their son. But all such hopes were quickly dashed away to fear and to despair. It says here in the passage that for three days they searched for Jesus. It seemed that they had unturned every stone between their first night's village and Jerusalem. That they had looked behind every tree on the way and out of the way and had asked every person coming into and out of Jerusalem if they had seen, have you seen my Jesus? And after three days, their exhaustive search left them with nothing. No clues, no leads. No hope. Finally, their search led them to the temple complex. And at the temple complex, they noticed a crowd of people gathered around a few teachers and a few wise men. The crowd kept them from seeing who those teachers were, but from its midst, they heard the familiar, not yet mature voice of of their lost son, Jesus. They pressed through the crowd to retrieve their boy, but before they could reach him, they stopped in amazement at what they heard. They stopped in amazement at his words. Not only they, not only Mary and Joseph, but also According to Luke chapter 2 and verse 48, everyone who heard him was astonished, was amazed at his understanding and at the answers that he gave and at the questions that he offered. They marveled at his wisdom, not just that his wisdom excelled his years and his experience, but that his wisdom, even at the age of 12 years, his wisdom excelled that of all men. It seemed to those who heard Jesus' words as if he knew all things. Now the miracles, the miracles that Jesus performed were noteworthy for their, for their significance and for their scope. Jesus performed signs and wonders that left no doubt of his supernatural ability even among his detractors and his enemies 
Those miracles that Jesus performed were so numerous that one of his disciples noted that if they should be written down, the world itself could not contain the books that should be written about all of Jesus' miracles. But before Jesus' miracles, before his works left a mark on the world, it was his words. It was his words, even before his miracles, it was his words that made an impression on men and women alike. It was his words, his words that prompted a handful of men to leave everything behind and follow him. It was his words that convinced Jews and Samaritans that he was indeed the Christ. And after Jesus offered what we call the Sermon on the Mount, the people were astonished at his doctrine because he taught them as one having authority. It was his words that left a lasting impression upon those who heard his words. I think it's fair to say that even still the words of Christ Leave an impression upon all those who hear those words. Because the words of Christ carry life. The words of Christ carry healing. The words of Christ carry peace. Let's consider first for just a few moments... That the words of Christ carry life. Whether, whether you've been a part of this church family from before its current pastor. Or are a recent addition to this church family. You know that we as a church body have been touched by the cold and relentless hand of death. Every one of us here has felt the cold hand of death upon us. Nevertheless, we live and we look forward to life. And where exactly do we find life? Where do we find life? Now some find life behind the wheel of a fast car. But this is really living. Maybe on the seat of a cool motorcycle. That's the life. Some find life in a, in a short sofa or in a, in a, in a huge motorhome. Some find life on the seat of a boat. Some of us just find life on the couch in front of the television. We find life in our hobbies. We find them in our leisure. We find life in that which brings us pleasure, that which brings us satisfaction. Those are things in which we find life. We find life in our families and in our friends and in, our, and in those organizations to which we have dedicated ourselves. And I would say that all such things are good. That we find them to be blessings from the Lord for which we are thankful but they are also, admittedly, things that are more related to this life than to the next life. They are things that are more earthly or worldly than they are heavenly. They are things, admittedly, that are more relevant to the flesh than they are to the spirit. And among all these other things in which we might find life, may we also find life in the words of Jesus. It is Jesus who said, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh, the flesh promises.
profits nothing. And then Jesus said the words. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. The words are life. Then a little bit later, God in John's gospel, at the sometimes difficult words of Jesus, his crowds began to, to diminish. As they got smaller and smaller, Jesus asked his disciples if they also would leave him. To which Peter, without hesitation, replied, To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. The words of Christ carry life. Yea, the words of Christ are life. If we find, if we find as we do sometimes that our Christian lives are in need of a little regeneration, that our Christian lives are in need of a little bit of revitalization, we will discover that regeneration, we'll discover revitalization when we return our focus to the words of Christ. Because the words of Christ, they carry life. The words of Christ, secondly, carry healing. We know what it is to struggle with disease and ailments and illnesses and pain. And for some, for some of us, we may find that there is no foreseeable relief from any of them. Furthermore, beyond the physical ailments which hinder our lives, we note the condition in which we find our world and our country, maybe our families, broken in spirit, divided by strife. And maybe it is that even more so than our bodies, our world, our country, our families, our own, our own spirits require a touch of healing because they're broken. Such healing, such healing is found in the words of Christ. As an example, I give to you an account that's offered to us in the Gospel of John, chapter 4. During, during Jesus' day, a little boy, just a little boy, the son of a noble man, lay sick and dying in a distant town. The boy's father came to Jesus. The boy's father traveled about 18 miles from his town to where Jesus was, and he begged Jesus to come, please come home with me and heal my son. He knew that his son was at the point of death. And when the man came to Jesus, Jesus didn't go with the man. He simply said, go your way. Your son lives. Jesus instantly healed that little boy without touching him, without being in his presence, without even being near the child. He simply spoke the word and it was so. So think about that for just a second or two. The man had traveled at least 18 miles to find Jesus and to beg Jesus to come back with him to heal his dying son. And all Jesus did was say to the man, go home without me. 
Your son is going to live. I've already healed him. Without need for proof, that man just took Jesus at his word. Now that is faith. There is no record in John chapter 4 that when Jesus said, Go home, your son lives, I've already healed him. There is no record that that man said, Are, are you sure about that? Really? You're sure about that? Can you give me some, some proof about that? He simply took Jesus at his word. John chapter 4 verse 50 says that the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto you. Maybe our own souls are, are a, little bit, a little bit broken. They're in need of some mending. Maybe our souls are are wounded and in need of a touch of healing. Let's just trust in Jesus. Trust in his word. Because the words of Christ, they carry healing. And lastly, we consider that the words of Christ carry peace. Watch the news. Just a, just a glance at any news channel. It doesn't matter which one. Pick it. Any news channel or a perusal of any newspaper, it, it tends to toss us into a tumultuous sea of chaos and confusion and doubt and fear. And though... Though we neither expect it to be otherwise, nor anticipate any improvement, we shudder at the prospect of sin's evil capacity and of humanity's inability to hamper sin's capacity. What we could use in our world, what we could use in our own lives is a is a measure of stability, some calm, some calm in the midst of a stormy sea. We could use a little, a little peace, lasting, permanent peace. And that calmness, that, that kind of stability, that peace that seems to elude us is found in the words of Christ. The Gospel according to Mark records an event in which Jesus' disciples found themselves in the midst of a life-threatening storm in a little boat on the Sea of Galilee. And with that vessel full of water, they struggled for their lives. They feared for their lives. And their master, their teacher, their guide, their savior, Jesus, while they struggled against the storm, Jesus lay fast asleep on a pillow. They awoke Jesus with a, with a touch of rebuke in their voices and said, do you not care that we perish? They said, Master, the tempest is raging. The billows are tossing high. The sky is overshadowed with blackness. No shelter, no help is nigh. Carest thou not that we perish? How? How canst thou fall asleep when each moment so madly is threatening a grave in the angry deep? The gospel account says that Jesus arose, he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. 
by His words. By nothing more than His words, Jesus brought peace to an otherwise uncontrollable situation. Jesus said, The winds and the waves shall obey my will. Peace, be still. Whether the wrath of the storm-tossed sea or demons or men or whatever it be, no water can swallow the ship where lies the master of ocean and earth and skies. They all shall sweetly obey my will. Peace, be still. Admittedly, life, life is rarely serene. Its uncertainty is exacerbated by pain and disease and violence and doubt and fear and death. If we are looking for peace in our lives, if we're looking for security and stability in our souls and in our minds, if we are looking for the peace of God that surpasses, that surpasses all human understanding and reason, we will find that peace in the words of Christ. We might cry out, Master, Jesus, with anguish of spirit, I bow in my grief today. The depths of my sad heart are troubled. Awaken and save, I pray. Torrents of sin and of anguish sweep over my sinking soul and I perish. I perish. Dear Master, hasten. And take control. To which Jesus might just respond. The winds and the waves shall obey my will. Peace be still. Whether the wrath of the storm-tossed sea, or demons, or men, or whatever it be, no water can swallow the ship where lies the master of ocean and earth and skies. They all shall sweetly obey. They all shall sweetly obey my will. Peace, peace, be still. The words of Christ carry life. The words of Christ carry healing. The words of Christ carry peace. Amen.
In the name of our great high priest, Jesus the Christ, dear God, I offer this blessing upon your people. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Amen. Bind up.